interdisciplinary boundaries from vernacular architecture to leisure places and from architectural theory to migrant places he has published in academic architecture journals professional magazine and editorial books as well as union working papers he was the founder chairman of the board of architectural publication of sri lanka institute of architects and was the founder editor of forum a students research publication at the university of newcastle uk he also founded and edits the internationally referred journal built environment sri lanka published by sri lanka institute of architects and the isvs e journal published by international society for study of vernacular settlements since 2011 He is also on the editorial board of the Asian Journal of Environment Behavioral Studies and Asian Journal of Architecture and Behavior since 2009 and acts as a reviewer for the CSAAR conferences and the Journal of Geography and Planning. In 2013, he founded the serial conference Cities, People and Places held at the University of Morathwa, Sri Lanka and the internationally referred journal Cities, People, Places also published by the University of Morathwa. He is also a member of advisory board of the International Society for the Study of Vernacular Settlements. With a variety of experiences in academic research, teaching, consultancy, and research-based practice, Dr. Ranjit Dayaratne bridges theory and design through the ideas of architecture as a social art. Sir, I humbly invite you now to chair the session. Oh, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction. I, I seem to have done a lot of things and seem to be doing far too many things right now. Anyway, um, let me welcome you all to the final session of the ISVS 10. Uh, like I was trying to say, uh, seems like we have a few presenters, probably the best selected, hopefully, uh, and a lot more time for discussion afterwards. We have uh, four presentations lined up for the final session. um from richa jagatramka and dr ashwani kumar i was saying that names are familiar to me they have published in the isbse journal inda vidya stuti again i'm very familiar with her and then yashika sharma and ashwani kumar both of them are also known to me thankfully yeah great to meet you again all do digitally um so without much ado let us start off with the first presenter like professor sanjeev was saying with india vidya stuti who is going to talk to us about the transformation of the huma besar architecture to bola settlement architecture the flow is yours india thank you very much uh, professor sanjeev let me share my screen okay i hope it is visible enough yeah it's it's coming Yeah. Okay. Yes. Please. I'm. Uh, I'm opening it into full screen now. Yeah, it's there now. Ouch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Dayaratne, and also. Uh, 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 attendees. Uh, my name is Inda Vidya Stuti. Uh, I'm writing this topic with my colleagues Nur Hijra, uh, and our topic is uh, transformations and redomestications in Karampuang vernacular architectures in Indonesia, from Lekeang Rumah Besar to Bola Architecture. Actually, the, the title has been developed after revisions. Uh, so, with this topic, we would like to share our reflective insight on our research, the impact of modernizations on the vernacular architectures of society with matrilineal inheritance in Indonesia and we would further discuss and uh, discuss it in the framework of redomestication uh, this is the positions of the karampong hamlet in indonesia in sulawesi provinces in sinjai district and the hamlet is in the small green area in that uh, uh, in that spot The architectural landmark in Karampuang Hamlet is a pair of ancestral houses which are called rumah besar in Malay language or lau pole in local Konjo language in Bugis uh, language uh, of the Bugis ethnic. It literally means big house. Rumah besar or lau pole appear as, ancest- uh, as a pair of ancestral houses representing two dual leadership of Amatoa and Gela, the heaven and the earth. Rumah besar Tomatoa is belonging to the highest leader Amatoa and rumah besar Penggela belonging to Tutgela the Amatoa's accompanying leader 
Amidst the research, we came across a narrative about architectural evolutions prescribed in the traditional text, which is called Lontara Karampuang. Lontara means palm leaf. It said that the rumah besar is the end result of an evolution from an umbrella structure house or lekeang to three-legged house or laupuri, which is later transformed into the rectangular plant house or rumah besar. The domestication here is used to understand the nature of transformation in vernacular architectures of the Karampuang using uh, Karampuang architecture as the case. Our research is a field research on the hamlet on the rich terrain of Bawakareng Mountains in South uh, Sulawesi provinces. Traditionally, the people depend on forest and paddy farming. And we conduct in-depth interview with ladies in, of the house, informants and experts, as well with the traditional leaders. Now let me proceed with a glimpse of the architecture and settlement. The most popular architectures of the Karampuang is the ancestral house, the Laupole or Rumah Besar. It was said that the old, in the old time, inhabitants of the village is believed to dwell in a single house. The most significant characters of the Rumah Besar is that it was believed to be female. And all of its architectural elements contain female body symbolization. Rumah Besar or Laupole is said to be the result of uh, formal transformations from Lekiang to Laupole and its relocation from the higher place on Lapa Hill to present area. Uh, the existence of Rumah Besar symbolically relates to the duality of heaven and earth, past and future. It was marked by the different rich orientations of Rumah Besar Tomatoa and Rumah Besar Panggela. The current Puang adhered to common word view called Adeepa or the law of four. It essentialized the balance of the four natural elements and make it the base for many symbolic system, including leadership of the four traditional officers. The people believe that the land is female on which a female ancestress descended down from the sky. This descended down, the descendant of the female ancestor is believed to be the kin of Amatoa, the guardian of cosmic order. He is accompanied by three other leaders. Gela is responsible for the land and asset management. Sanro is for social well-being. Sanro has to be female. And, and Guru is the custodian of education and ritual. These four leaders are of equal importance. But in later period, this quadrangle order were polarized, uh, polarized into duality of Amatoa and Gela, each represented and hold office from Rumah Besar. Sanro and Guru live in Rumah Besar with, Toma, with Amatoa, in Rumah Besar uh, Tomatoa and their community. And Gela is in Rumah Besar Panggela with his community. We suspect that these formations uh, were initiated after the introductions of the paddy culture. Nevertheless, the equal importance of the four uh, are kept being reminded in quadrangle symbolic system expressed in ornamentations, rituals, and kinships. This indicates the flexibility of Adeepa in responding to the changing context in the term of social organization. Today, when external power is becoming so strong following modern and globalization, Gela hold most of the significant role. Earlier, when Islam came into the hamlet, Guru take most of the role. The second type of house uh, uh, is the wooden uh, indiv individual wooden house or bola, bola uh, characterized by veranda. It marks the situations when Karampuang inhabitants started to reside outside Rumah Besar in individual house. The first bola started to be built in 1950s around Rumah Besar. One notable incident, uh, one notable incident in Karampuang history was the burning of Rumah Besar in 1967 during the post-independence turmoil by the National Army. Nevertheless, Rumah Besar was rebuilt. The bola kept being but the bola kept being built even more frequently due to the popularity of individual living follow that follow modern lifestyle. The proliferations of bola residences and its accumulations in lower area of Rumah Besar form a residential quarter, which is Bola neighborhood. Later involvement is Rumah Batu, uh, sorry, Rumah Batu, or Bola architecture with mixed modern structure inserted in between Bola. Oh, sorry, the earlier is Bola, this is the wooden Bola, and this is the Rumah Batu, or stone uh, house. Rumah Besar, Bola, and Rumah Batu maintain common tripartite vertical order of God, human, and underworld. They have common center of Astis Mundi in Central Pole or Posibola with granary uh, or Rekeang on the roof. Uh, kindly not confuse Rekeang or granary and Lekeang or the ancient form, form of ancestral house. 
The set of a central pole and granary are celebrated during festivals. Despite the rectangle plan, the rituals follow the schemata of circle formations around the central pole, reminding to the schemata of Lekeang. In fact, by rituals, the integrity of the people is formed by central pole granary networks. These residential typologies are located in different sectors in the landscape, on the landscape. Karantuang landscape is actually appear as natural landscape with sketchy spatial segmentation. At glance, it has only rumah besar as its monumental features. But our exploration revealed three sectors of places which bear traces of earlier involvement of settlement. The first is in Gunung Area or Bukit Lapa or Lapa Hill, where two rituals were conducted and hypothetically, Lekiang was built in the area. There are lots of archaeological artifacts finding in this area. Second is Rumah Besar area as already explored and third is Bola neighborhood. Here is the people of the Karampuang established their cohesive bound by kinship system in the Bola neighborhood. They, uh, they are bound by the kinship which is called Gigi. Gigi is a kin grouping based on four cousins associations that each refer to one of the four Ade Epa leader, Amatoas, Gela, Sandro, and Guru. The four cousins associations are consolidated from the two Rumah Besars. In this way, the domestic space is manifested in the dwelling integrations of Rumah Besar and Bola neighborhood. The three generations of settlements are connected to one another by T junctions marked by monuments, such as sacred stone installation or uh, batu gong that appears as if a limbus between Gunung area and Rumah Besar. And the reason one is the monument between Rumah Besar and Bola settlement. Now I would like to discuss this, uh, this transformations redomestication framework. Redomestication roots on the word domus and domestication. Domus is a latent word that means a house in physical sense for a content or a body or life in natural sense. Let's say that architectural ar architecture reflect attempts to frame body in a domus in various scales and ways. It took design ingenuity to, for a domus to conform rightly with the body. When the conformity of domus and body is attained, we could say domestication is chief, and it can be explained here by the concept of domesticity and domestic space. In short, domestication means a search for new stable situation that make a home and sense of homeness. And the domestication is a transformative process to regain new architectural equilibrium or of traditions and dwelling culture after fundamental changes, generally due to ecological or some uh, political occurrence. Our explorations come up with historical sequence that marks some transformations of residential structure in Karampuang Hamlet. First is Lekeang. Lekeang architecture signify an architecture of the forest society in Karampuang or its first, uh, uh, first society, should I use Jarzo term. Intensive agriculture brought by the contextual development in the area come up with the next phase of transformation, Lao Pole architectures, upon which the current Rumah Besar model emerged in a pair of Rumah Besar Tomatoa and Panggela. Later, there come modernization on which Bola architecture started to be built and marked the modernization and post-independent situation. The habitation was then established as the pairing of Rumah Besar and Bola neighborhood. And the most recent one is Rumah Batu. Some transformations may appear as a formal adaptation and appropriations of new materials, but it may be the case of, the, uh, but it may be the case of domestication when the changes lead to fundamental changes. It may have taken place in the transformation from Lekeang to Lao Pule because domesticity changes from forest based to agriculture based. Unfortunately, we could not elaborate this uh, further yet because uh, we need archaeological ex expertise to deal with this. But we may explore the redomestication in the transformations of Rumah Besar dwelling culture into the pairing of Rumah Besar and Bola dwelling after fire incidents in 1967. And here, here is, uh, we try to elaborate the discussion as follow. Transformation process before 1967 could be described as follow. The Domus or Lao Pole was a rectangle plan Rumah Besar, which was originally the umbrella structure on Lekeang. The underlying and redomestication was events in a long period of time brought by introductions of agriculture, followed by encounters with foreign culture, including the assimilation with Islam, and the relocations of Lao Pole from Lapa Hill to present Rumah Besar. We may still need to investigate whether the term Rumah Besar was acquired from Melayu or Malay language during Islam introductions or from Bahasa Indonesia after independence. The domesticity was manifested in a secluded rural landscape with traditional paddy farming. 
Its activity was influenced by maritime cosmopolitan dynamic on the Gulf of Bonny, seaport not far from Karampuang. Internally, they maintain forest life, practice of Gigi kinship with maternal inheritance and adherence to Adepa value system. The idealizations of the domestic space happen through recontextualizing the site of ancient settlement on Lapa Hill into rental ground and relocations of the ancestral house to present location. Therefore, the evolution of Laupole, at least before 1965-67, is comprehended as a long time reformations following the dynamic interactions with external power and influences. Entering 20th century, specific occurrence took place that changed situations in Karampuang, which is modernization. It brought to Karampuang modern openness to the world, market economy, increase of patriarchy, modern reinstitutionalization to the state administration, functioning uh, functionalisms and pragmatisms, and the use of industrial materials for their architecture. After 1967, the Domus acknowledged new type of residential structure and settlement, which is Bola and Bola neighborhood. Redomestication is marked by fire incidents in Rumah Besar 1967, followed by the constructions of modern infrastructure intensively. The Domestic City after 1967 is manifested in rural landscape with modern agriculture sponsored by government. They also plants export crops for commercial purposes, but keep their rice produces only for their community. They partly depend, depend on remittance on to relative from migrant place doing modern profession, and it explains the affinity to individual life. Nevertheless, they are faithful to landscape of origin. The idea of domestic space is shaped by functional and pragmatic motivation of living in the individual uh, in, domestic, uh, in a domestic unit or bola. To preserve the, uni the unifying uh, characters and value of Rumah Besar as ancestral houses pro is prohibitions of copying Rumah Besar architecture style on bola was issued. In this respect, transformation is understood as the establishment of new equilibrium when the Karampuang dwelling culture has to redraft their communal, feminine, and organic body of dwelling culture upon well-consolidated modern scheme managed by the state and the world. New indications of transformation follow the proliferations of Rumah Batu since 1980s. Globalization and modernization potentially make the international system part of its domesticity, through tourism at least, but it would take further time to see if it would be the case of redomestication. Now, the last is reflection. We conclude that the maintenance of Rumah Besar for the Karampuang people is far from the motive of identity making and authenticity. The remaking, recontextualizing, reaffirming technology, symbolic system and social order are strategic effort to survive that habitation amidst the changing nature of the context. And among many phases of transformation, like Keang, Rumah Besar, Bola architecture reflects some involvement that managed to produce refined architectures with a stable idea of domestic space and relevant with respective context of domesticity. We suspect that matrilineal inheritance is also not a rigid treatise, but a feminine strategy to keep a degree of solidarity that enable communal design. Such policy is also inherent in most of others' symbolic systems which promote ecological nurturance. And whatever construction tradition that appear in a certain period of time, what matter is that whatever the design, it should enable construction that harness the value of solidarity, communalism, and collective work. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Inda, for that very analytical uh, presentation about the domestication of the housing in the um, in uh, Bula's settlement. I think it was a very interesting paper in terms of, to some extent, as I saw, is a contrary to what we were trying to say in terms of investigation. I'm trying to demonstrate the fact that domestication is an ongoing process because you traced it from uh, origins of the settlements to the contemporary. So it's a very interesting paper in that sense. And we will return to that discussion later on uh, at the time of our discussion session. So let's move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. And if you could uh, unshare, we will go to the next presentation, which is by Richa Jagat Jagatanka and Dr. Ashwani Kumar. Transformation of stone dwellings in Kudargad in Chakistan. Dr. Ashwani and Richa.
Richa, are you there? Yes, sir. Richard, you uh, you can start the presentation. Please share your presentation. Is the screen visible? Not yet. So now? Yeah, it is visible. Yes. Yes, we can see it now. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ranjit sir. Good, good afternoon, all the people on the dais. So my, uh, our topic of uh, the presentation is based on transformation of stone, stone dwellings of Kudar, Kudargarh, Chhattisgarh. That's a village in Chhattisgarh that we'll be talking about. Uh, <clears throat> the content of the presentation goes as to, we will be talking about Vanakra architecture as an introduction, an introduction to Chhattisgarh, the need for studying methodology, architecture of Kudargarh, transformation of the vernacular houses, the findings and the conclusion. So vernacular architecture, vernacular architecture practices embrace indigenous folk tradition and community architectural practices. They are applicable not just to a single built entity, but also to settlements constructed from local materials and indigenous knowledge. It is an identity of the region and not only locally, but also regional and national. This approach, along with influence of local climate, geographical terrain, and availability material has created different notions of various countries in viewing vernacular architecture. In India, there are six ways in which we view vernacular architecture. One of it is the local climate, then we have the geographical terrain, then we have uh, <clears throat> the kind of local material and indigenous knowledge that is there. We have the uh, response to kind of earthquakes or any natural calamities that are there. And then we have response to the social culture. So looking at all these responses, now we'll be talking about Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh is one of the tribal uh, dominant states, which ranks fifth in India in terms of tribal density. The tribes in this area traditionally have lived a forest in which they've hunted, fish, uh, done fishing, gathered herbs and fruits, and practices and practice shifting agriculture. What we have also see, observed in the tribes here is they build their temporary structures, and all the tribes are very varied from each other in those uh, in that category. Uh, having adapted, built, uh, adapting everything from the local <coughs> uh, materials that is available. So, house of uh, so if you look at the census, we have seen that the uh, you know when you're talking about transformation, we also look at the census what they are seeing. So in Chhattisgarh, we have seen that in terms of flooring, mud flooring, which is seen in, in uh, as 92.5 percent in Chhattisgarh in 2001, has lowered to 83 percent in rural houses today, and uh, uh, use of concrete has increased from 4 percent to 12 percent. So this, uh, these census readings in which we also saw that mud walls were converted from 76.3% uh, to 72%. And then the roof tilings were also changed where, you know, there's a fall from 87.7% to 74%. This kind of census studies led us to understand that there are some kind of transformations which are happening in the rural part of India or a certain uh, going into depth uh, in Chhattisgarh. So we started looking at different villages, one of which was Kudargarh. The methodology that we adapted to study this was an observation survey and one-to-one presented -one interview. In the survey, we observed the kind of transformation that was done in planning the walls, uh, the materials uh, and construction technique for the floors, roofs, and doors and windows. Come to Khudargarh. This is my site. Uh, this is the site, Khudargarh. So this is actually based near a mountain, uh, actually on a mountain, and uh, they have access to local stone very easily available there. There are almost 180 houses. The survey included approximately 150 houses. Uh, so here in this image, we can see a basic architecture of Kudarga. So these are all stone walls, which are cladded with mud plaster and then finished with mud slurry. <clears throat> so um, this is the basic view uh, of architecture of Kudarga. So coming to the detail and the spatial planning. So we usually see that there is rectangular or L-shaped house of the residence, as you can see in the image here. Uh, so they have the outer uh, external veranda that is the otla, and they have the living space, and then they have the inner veranda which is used for workspace. The courtyard is there, and then they have animal shelters. In the living space, there are usually two or three rooms, depending on the number of family members that are there in the house. There is a kitchen space, 
and uh, the central courtyard is very predominant in all the houses and which always houses a sacred plant in this case there is a tulsi in most of the houses that we see the walls so all the internal and external walls are built of locally sourced material that is stone so they have used random double masonry in most of the places and then they have used <clears throat> Oh, wall pl uh, mud plaster with finishing with mud slurry again on top of it mud and cow dung slurry there are no openings on the exterior walls that are observed but uh, some openings are there nowadays some openings are there in the internal walls where uh, the, where there are very small openings but through the through the internal courtyard the flooring of the houses the flooring of the houses are usually mud finished they are built of mud and in few of the houses we can see ornamentation of which is called rangoli on the floors with the uh, rice powder which is done there on a regular basis the roof the roof of this village is a theme of sloping roof made of timber or bamboo and covered with baked tiles so these are handmade baked tiles although the availability of stone is abundant in this area there are no stone slates used for roofing they have always been used baked clay shingles itself there are uh, when you look at the house plan with the lower level only is a living space there is a The, there are uh, timber sections which are built here so to create an attic this attic helps as a buffer space which helps to uh, retain the climatic uh, atmosphere inside so in winter what they do is they place husk over the attic so as to trap the heat and in summer they remove it so that there is a kind of stack uh, ventilation that happens there doors and windows so this is the kind of internal windows that we see there otherwise uh, there is nothing as such which is a particular the uh, you know a well thought of window or door design initially these houses did not have any uh, door or window they just had an opening for the entrances to the rooms and and elsewhere then um, slowly they started building on to the proper doors and windows with wooden frames so let's talk about the transformation in the in this village so we've seen this transformation in five stages stage 1 is original vernacular form of the house stage 2 was divided when we understand that in the se second stage there was insertion of doors and windows in stage 3 there were change in building materials so if you uh, the what we have observed is in the building materials from mud they have gone to brick and in few cases they have also gone to rtc in uh, fourth case it's introduction to basic infrastructure so there was no infrastructure um, such as water or sanitation facility that was available now that has started being introduced due to a lot of government inter uh, interventions too stage 5 was complete transformation when the houses have transformed themselves completely leaving no aspect of the vernacular definition behind so this is the section of an original form of the house where you can see the entrance uh, the living space that is there in the big center uh, the courtyard with the sacred plant and then the animal shelter that's there So this courtyard was also used for various activities of working and uh, plantation of uh, a few vegetables. Any waste that came from the cow shed or from the kitchen was all recycled here. So this is the stage one original part of the house, uh, where we can see that uh, this is the entrance. The kitchen is there near the entrance. There's a bed, the bedrooms which are aligned, and then the entrance takes you directly to the outer, outer. Um, sorry, inner courtyard, uh, where and then you have the access to the Cowshed. <clears throat> so in uh, the stage two, we see there are doors and windows inserted. Inserted, so they are all uh, uh, doors and windows based on wooden frames. Stage three, we see that there are change in material. So as you can see in the image, there is a change in flooring material. Also, they have they have the base made of stone, and then on top of that, they have laid concrete. so as to uh, have something which they do not need to maintain time and again as with a mud finish with mud plaster and mud finishing of slurry they had to do that time and again so as to retain it well otherwise it would crack at places but with concrete now they have uh, less of that and that is why they have uh, started to adapt it uh, other than that we will see change in wall materials the change in wall materials as we can see here with the extension of the house is all been done in brick even few of the houses have been brought down and now they are rebuilding it in brick itself so this is also led to this because uh, the government defines these houses as semi pakka or kacha houses but with uh, construction of complete brick they will also be getting the nomenclature of being a pakka house and uh, also uh, because of various schemes that have come up people are more encouraged to do this 
difference in roofing material the roofing material from the roof covering being clay shingles they have turned to asbestos sheets and in few cases where the bamboo or timber has been used they have started using gi pipes introduction to basic infrastructure as you can see in the plan the, in the toilets are placed you know outside the living area compound so they usually is, they do not have a habit of using the toilets uh, within the house itself they are not acceptable to that and that's why they have built it at the backyard as it has been made it has been very pushed along into their regime when we see complete transformation so as you can see in the house there's nothing left of the old uh, vernacular vocabulary that was there they have started building flat roofs completed everything to have full concrete and rcc uh, with only little bit of the special planning that has been left behind this is various stages of transformation uh, stage 1 to 5 stage 1 to 5 uh, so we have a settlement the so settlement planning is usually uh, similar that is based on both sides of the central axis for stage 1 and 2 in third since they have started growing their houses Uh, and started building new ones next to their old houses also they have started getting compact clusters the spatial planning the living area in the kitchen along with annual shelter was there for a long time and then you know towards the stage four we see that in eliminating the uh, animal shelter people have started building that as a living space itself so the flooring has been changed from mud flooring to cement flooring or mud walls have been converted to brick walls the plaster has been changed from mud plaster to cement plaster in columns or uh, support structures we see initially there are bamboo or mud piles which have been changed to rcc and brick piles roof structure bamboo and timber were initial roof structures that was used now which is turned to gi pipes in few of the cases roof covering for clay based tiles now which are as either rcc or asbestos sheets uh, doors and windows initially we have no doors and windows to windows Uh, compound wall. So they usually have uh, the houses in Kunalgarh all have compound walls, and they are all made of random rubble masonry. So animal shelter also started to diminish in the new stage of transformation of houses there. <coughs> so the takeaways, uh, the findings of the study were: the changes are taking place gradually, and the residents of the villages are adapting to the new built culture. The house in the villages have started to transform and lie in between stage one to five. the materials are the materials used in construction are easily accessible and available to the villagers the transformation of the residents reduces the constant need for maintenance for the structure people in the village are still tied to their culture and social norms and are indifferent to the changes in the built environment in the conclusion the transformations are random and there are no norms or restrictions for the changes there are no social disputes or cultural changes that have been observed the transformation has introduced new technologies to the villages which they have learned and adapted giving the residents an additional opportunity for income and better infrastructure the use of modern material has its own perks and demerits as they are more stable they need less maintenance the the use but it also has led to use of various mechanical ventilation devices which is impacting negatively on the energy efficiency and also to the sustainability of the structures the village illustrates the impact of economic social and cultural on the transformation of buildings in the place <coughs> These are my references of the study. Thank you. So Thank you I, very much. Uh, finished here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Finishing on time, precisely. Thank you very much, uh, Richa, for that uh, introduction to the tribal village and the architecture of that tribal community, which it appears to be huge. 25.5 million you said the uh, general our perception of tribal communities is that they are usually small in numbers and wandering in uh, small regions but it seems like a huge country itself um you talked about the um, changes that are taking place particularly in the built form in terms of materiality and uh, but you made a very interesting observation which will struck me really speaking and you said that the cultural norms and social practices haven't actually changed but stay too which raises some interesting question because what is the connection that exists between the built environment and the home and house and the culture if there is a disassociation material change can yet um, sustain culture 
is a very interesting observation. I think we will return to that discussion at the time when we go to discussion. Thank you very much. And um, we will move on to the next presenter, which is uh, by uh, Yashika Sharma and Ashwani Kumar. Uh, I would believe that Yashika is making the presentation and yes. the title is Modern Farm Structure to accommodate the change in performance needs of the agricultural technology. Yes, sir. Please share your presentation. Sure, sir. So is my screen visible? It's beginning to appear, yes. I think you need to enlarge it, go to the full view. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Um, okay. Uh, a very warm good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Yashika Sharma, an undergraduate student pursuing bachelor's in architecture and planning from MIT Jaipur. And today I'm here to present my views on the changing agricultural practices and how a modern farm structure can accommodate them. So beginning with the abstract, being a developing country, a significant population of India depends on agriculture for their livelihood. But with the increasing food demand and climate change, people have started to adopt modern farming techniques. However, in the rush of acquiring technology, the vernacular architecture, which is closely related to agriculture, has been left behind. So my study was concerned with the analysis of vernacular architecture of Assam and how it can be modified to serve the purpose of modern day agricultural infrastructure. So as we know that practice of agriculture is one of the first activities which led human to settle down. Eventually, the agricultural byproduct and waste began to be used as construction material. It varied from place to place and thus each region developed its own kind of architecture. Thus, it can be concluded that vernacular architecture of a place is significantly affected by agricultural practices of that region. As shown in the picture, it is very clear that the materials used in vernacular architecture of Himachal region is different from that of Assam. Uh, while wood has been used in Himachal, Thatch and bamboo are abundantly used in Assam because of their availability. So it can be said that the shape, volume and material of a house was determined by available local resources, type of farm structure required and the farm produce. Now talking about the problems uh, which led to the abandonment of vernacular farm uh, uh, structures there. There are three major problems which led to their declination. First is the beginning of colonial period marked the use of uh, foreign material which gradually grow until uh, bricks, concrete and RCC were extensively used. Secondly, due to extensive use of fertilizer and pesticide, the quality of soil degrades and a farmer has to relocate to a new place and abandon the previous one. Third, we need a high performance uh, farm structure which could, which could suffice the need of the present. But traditional farms couldn't work in accordance and therefore becomes, becomes irrelevant. So, as a, uh, as a possible solution, the concept of vernacular architecture of Assam are being analyzed and understand, uh, to understand their principles and objectives and how they can be implemented in present day. Specifically, the architecture of Ikra and Garo house has been studied as they are an excellent example of earthquake and flood resistant houses. Next, I have studied the concept and working of greenhouse farming and how a hydroponic greenhouse function. All of this is studied to integrate the principle of vernacular and modern farms and devise a sustainable solution. So starting with the uh, vernacular architecture of Assam, the traditional houses of Assam displays excellent resistance against flood and earthquake. The structure is made porous and on the stilt to avoid collection of flood water. Secondly, the roof uses local material like thatch, bamboo and timber, which insulate the house against extreme weather conditions. Uh, Ikra house, here bamboo has been extensively used as structural material, which gives flexibility and earthquake resistance to the house. Diagonal bracing further strengthens the house as shown in the top right figure. Then the floor is also made of woven bamboo strips to drain access flood water and the house or granaries were made on stilts to avoid moisture, rodent and flood water. Uh, the images here shows typical example of Ikra and Garo houses using bamboo as main construction material and being built on stilts. 
uh, then garo house next is the uh, this is the uh, garo house which again uses earthquake resistance and uses same construction technique as ikra house these houses can span up to 260 feet by 40 feet which gives the notion that long span farm structure can also be made using similar construction techniques uh so the uh, the left figure here shows that major construction uh, material used in garo house uh, uh, shows the uh, the major construction material that is being used in garo house and the right figure shows the permeable weave floor to drain out access water uh so from the uh, study of vernacular architecture of assam uh, the following inferences can be made that being deeply rooted to the use of bamboo as the main construction material the architecture shows diverse ways in which bamboo can be used for structure floor roof and walls the property of bamboo like seismic and water resistance make it more suitable and appropriate construction material in assam third the long span structure are you are also uh, are also made possible with post beam bamboo structures it is necessary to build structures on stilts to prevent it from heavy rain flood rodents etc besides bamboo timber and uh, thatch are also available in abundance and can therefore be used for modern day construction after being pro uh, processed accordingly uh, now talking about the greenhouse for modern farming techniques so uh, starting with the question of why do we actually need these greenhouses first is, first is that traditional farming methods are failing in a lot of ways to meet the food requirement secondly there is an increasing uh, public awareness about the source of food and people would want to access fresh food which is uh, available nearby and since greenhouses can also be set up in urban areas with much lesser space people would want to consume food from there next question is how is this more effective from uh, conventional farming so there are a lot of factor which make a greenhouse a better uh, a uh, method but it is uh, but if we specifically talk about the increase in productivity it can boost the per square meter production by allowing soilless and vertical farming second it can increase the crop growth speed now based on this analysis we come to a conclusion that self automated controlled environment greenhouses can provide favorable conditions for crop of all type it is not it just not reduces the time and labor but also increases the productivity then uh benefits as i said earlier a controlled environment for greenhouse possesses a lot of benefits out of which some of them i uh, i've mentioned here firstly it gives a favorable growing condition to crops of all kind even in extreme weather conditions yield and quality is significantly in increased as the nutrition nutrition supply is uh, measured fertilizer and pesticides are neg negligibly used and it's it saves the uh, crop from the natural calamities then the vertical stacking makes the most out of the land resource that is being provided so to maintain this control environment we need certain hardware which should be integrated with the build uh, with the structure so those are solar panels effective heating and cooling system adequate air circulation and ventilation controlled and automation system water and carbon dioxide supply so uh, these are two types of greenhouses active and passive system while the active one uses a complete automation system with cooling pads and exhaust for uh, cooling a passive cooling system uh, uses net meshes for air circulation so uh, after that for better understanding of the hyd uh, hydroponic greenhouse i did a case study of a greenhouse in udaipur it is a 1000 square meter greenhouse consisting of 20000 plants and since i was majorly concerned with the material used for its construction a generic greenhouse like this one uses structural steel members which are covered with plastic films the roof was covered with polycarbonate sheet for access to natural light while cutting the direct glare to the plants to protect the uh, crops in extreme uh, summers they had also placed uh, aluminum mats just uh, above the uh, just above the crops uh, to uh, to provide insulation against the extreme uh, weather conditions also they had masonry walls up to 1 meter uh, above which steel uh, members continue however it was noticed that the walls were damp due to uh, due to water circulation in the uh, cooling pads so um after uh, coming uh, uh, after concluding of designing a bamboo uh, greenhouse i looked for the ways in which people have 
pract- have been practicing or executing it on grounds and then i came across these two cases in japan and nigeria where bamboo has been used as the basic structural uh, material for the greenhouse uh, for the for building this these greenhouse they uses very simple uh, designs uh, for building these greenhouses and uh, bamboo is the structural uh, material but rest of it is just plastic films uh, and polycarbonate sheet so there is a scope that such non uh, uh, sustainable materials can can be reduced uh, and their scope can be reduced and they can be uh, substituted with more vernacular and local materials so uh, coming to the design that i've concluded after all these studies so uh, i designed a 24 into 15 meter uh, greenhouse which is supported with wooden post and beam system so as shown here the triple layered bamboo floor uh, will help in draining out excess water and this has been uh, inspired from what has been uh, done in the vernacular architecture uh, houses of assam then there are wooden beams at the floor level which are fixed to the foundation post to make this earthquake resistant bamboo bracing members are used on the wall while woven bamboo mats uh, make the walls of the greenhouse after that polycarbonate sheet it is used uh, as the roof covering for access to natural light and cutting down the glare then uh, while the aluminum mats which are be, which were being used which are conventionally used for insulation in a normal greenhouse it has been uh, replaced or substituted by the thatch because it's it also uh, has the similar properties of insulation then um, for the mechanical uh, equipments a uh, cooling pads and exhaust fans are placed on opposite wall and the air circulation is boosted by placing the circulation plan uh, circulation fan in between the span of the greenhouse uh, these uh, picture shows the uh, triple layer bamboo flooring and woven bamboo wall uh, construction that is uh, inspired and this, that is being used in the assam uh, vernacular architecture also so as a conclusion uh, vertical farming is a promising technology that can suffice the need of the present and hydroponic aeroponic and aquaponic systems can be integrated with the conventional farming method to solve the food crisis and the change and changing climate uh, the climate change that has been taking place then greenhouses are the primary structures which make it possible to create a controlled environment however greenhouses these days use non renewable materials like plastic film extensively while a modicum use of plastic cannot be avoided a significant quantity can be replaced with vernacular materials the vernacular architecture of assam sets an example of how sustainable structures can be achieved by using the local material and respect the local climate using the same principle of vernacular architecture of assam sustainable greenhouses um uh, uh, greenhouse can be designed to serve a bigger purpose by adhering to the elementary green architecture principle of energy efficient materials greenhouse can be effectively designed to take optimal advantages of the natural resource of the local resources these are the references thank you right thank you yashika for the presentation which seems to be a prescriptive study of how uh, the indian communities may shift themselves from uh, tending to agriculture based on the land to um, uh potentials of creating agriculture based on greenhouse uh, practices in which perhaps the use of traditional uh, materials could be used so it's a prescriptive it seems to be a prescriptive study which doesn't seem to happen at the moment um but it seems to be an interesting proposition so maybe we will come back to discuss the pros and cons of um, projecting and suggesting how one actually could adapt to the changing needs and demands of food insecurity and having to produce food in large scale which is a fundamental issue that the world will face eventually good presentation um thank you sir right thank you very much and we will move on to the final presenter of this session which is by brinda shah um brinda is talking about constancy and change in rural dwellings in saurashtra it's over to you brinda Yes. I'll just share my screen. Is 
Hello, is the screen visible? Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, my research uh, paper is basically based on the my continuous engagement with the uh, rural uh, part of uh, Western Peninsula of Gujarat, which is known as Saurashtra from 2005 to 2018. And I'm extremely grateful to my teachers, Dr. Paul Oliver and Marcel Wellinga to have put the seed of research and practice amalgamation into my uh, new direction, which is getting established. Uh, uh, so I'm going to brief you a little bit about the kind of things that which are happening uh, since 2005 and 18, 2018. These are the pictures from different parts of the Saurashtra. Saurashtra is, as you can see in the slide, the Western Peninsula, which is 18, uh, uh, sorry, eight districts all in all. And all the eight districts have different uh, sort of uh, happenings around them. Some of them have material change. Some of them have a, a formation change. Some of them have are uh, you know changes due to government aid aids. So there is a lot of uh, lot of mix which is going on and of change, and then there is a there is this uh, newer uh, aspiration and the kind of uh, social and cultural uh, realms people are people are uh, aspiring to sort of are suspecting to be in a shift and the whole I've I've been I've been observing these villages right from 2005 and it occurred to me that what could be the, the reasons for the change and, and why they are happening? Is there, are there really uh, external factors or they are, they are influenced by some other factors? So what you see in the slide is the kind of things which are happening old and new and the, 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 uh, the material changes and the kind of connotations which are changing. So what led me to this, uh, uh, this is to study a bit of a historical uh, reference and the and the kind of uh, you know the community divide which happens through the history. So initially in British colonial time, uh, Saurashtra was known as Kathiawar and it had uh, five major regions called uh, Halar, Ghed, Sorat, Jadavad, and Kohilwad, and all of these regions were community uh, dominant. So when you see uh, Halar, there are Darbars and uh, Mer communities, which are really dominant. Uh, in Gate, there are uh, Ayers, which are dominant. In Sorat, there are uh, Patels and Koli communities, which is dominant. In Jalawad, there is Koli community and mix of all uh, Brahmin and other caste, which are dominant. And Gohilwad is more of a, a Barwad Koli uh, community, Ayer community dominant. So I wanted to know that how does this community uh, dominance happen and does it have any uh, uh, any reference from the prehistoric time or or, uh, or some pre ancient time. So I from the studied from the uh, reference textual reference of uh, Bell, I realized that uh, Saurashtra was very active all along uh, from Maurya period to uh, Mughal Samrajya and to British colony time because of its location. It it shared eighteen hundred kilometers of uh, sea coast and due to that a lot of business and a lot of migration happened in this particular part of Gujarat uh, long before. So uh, does it really have any influence the manner in which the community is divided and how they are really sort of making this uh, place more uh, cultural and uh, uh, culturally uh, important. So having studied that, I realized that the community divide is clearly has come from uh, the kind of uh, different historic periods it has gone through. What you see in the right hand side of is the map which is derived by the text from Bell, which says that how does the population of the things have done. The second, uh, second reference is a typological reference because having to know that the community divide and a community dominance is actually a typological reference and how do you really how do you really understand that so from works of fisher and uh, uh, hakusha i realized that they have defined in their report on ratadi saying the occupational typology already exists and from works of uh, professor miki desai and madhvi desai 
uh, it says that the is basically forming of rooms osri which is called ordo osri which is a veranda and the kitchen uh, the location of the kitchen and the water space so basic formation consists of rooms uh, which is ordo osri which is a uh, semi open space and rasodu which is kitchen and water space which is paniyaru having studied that uh, throughout my observation i realized that not only the formation of the built but the formation of the open space and the scale of the open space is equally important in the community uh, reflections so in a barwar dwelling when you see the the barwar dwellings uh, what you see on the i am showing you through the cursor uh, they are on the periphery they have two accesses and because they are cattle breeders they are it is better to have two accesses uh, one from the village one from the outside and the open space is is basically uh, occupied with uh, the cattle the second uh, house formation is uh, high house type is koli patel dwelling in which the scale of the open space is again on the peripheral uh, they are peripheral house the scale of the open is much lesser uh, and uh, they have the kitchen outside uh, the house formation and within the as part of the more of a part of a open space then in the third part which is a, a devi puja dwelling they are the migratory people and uh, sometimes they have a permanent uh, space but they have the smallest uh, dwelling in the village again on the periphery uh, harijans uh, really don't have the uh, this community don't have a individual plot or a boundary to the house they have Uh, units which are combined together as a cluster with some sort of a shrine in the middle and they also have a multiple accesses what is most important is to understand that the dwellings of patel darbar and another other communities have the dela type dwelling which is a uh, some sort of a boundary wall and the open space is really defined or secured by the boundary wall and the scale of the open space is a uh, uh, one of the largest in amongst the all communities uh which stay in the village so i realized that the there is a, a higher level of understanding of how do people use open space and what are the what are what is its relation to the built formation or the typology and how does really uh, the change occur in that when there is some change happening in the built uh, fabric itself so i'm going to talk about four case studies here uh the four the reason for selection of the four uh, case studies is that uh, through my pilot uh, survey all across saurashtra uh, traveling 1200 uh, kilometers southwest northeast i realized that there is a mix of everything and one has to be very critical in in understanding how do how does one really select the village so one criteria i put to select the village is the village has to be a uh, minimum populated village uh, it has to be it has to be uh, starting from 1200 people to 2500 people residing in it second criteria was to the village must have old and new structures uh, both existing in the village uh, third is the villages should have to share a different kind of proximities the one proximity is the village has to be either very far remote from the town or the major uh, centers or very close to the major centers and the fourth uh, and the foremost uh, uh, criteria was that whether or not there is a uh, there is a presence of industry or any other uh, migration pattern which is seen in the village so with all these criteria uh, i'm going to discuss here uh, four villages of uh, different regions uh, the village uh, the first case study is motman village uh it is in jamnagar district as you can see here it is on the western northern uh, part of saurashtra and uh, the village settlement says that there is uh, there has been um, there has been a shift in from the village houses to the farmland houses and uh, since last uh, 12 uh, 12 years and the shift is because uh, in, within uh, last couple of years there is very good rain and there is lot of produce in the farms so there is a continuous presence which is required in the farm houses uh, so um, uh, this is this is the old uh, village uh, house of the same family 
which I have studied on the farm. Uh, this is their old house, which consists of a Dela type house, which one, uh, one gate is from the village, the other one is from the farm. And this is where the current family stays. All the other rooms uh, are now not uh, occupied uh, and they are not in a condition to uh, have uh, to stay. Uh, this is the on the pictures what you see the central courtyard is normally used by the farm produce uh, and the and the segregation of the of the produce and the rooms are uh, utilized to keep the dowry of the women which is for furniture uh, vessels uh, and the osri is basically a uh, entrance to the water and the kitchen space so this is how the old um, house is what is happening in the farmhouse is that uh, with uh, new construction, they have a new block which has been built uh, and the sense of the courtyard is now sort of redefined by the farms around it. Also, they have a newly built toilets and uh, which also redefines the, the activity which happened in the courtyard. Uh, because of uh, the newer newer material used in the spaces, the, the kind of uh, spaces you see inside the room, which is older, is also reorganized in a different manner compared to the old. Uh, they, they, in the kitchen, they have a, a gas stove, and but they also have a chula, which is a mud stove for a different kind of a food, uh, a millet food they cook as a roti. So, and uh, the notion of the osri is sort of rearranged uh, with, a, with a different flooring and uh, sort of uh, connecting only to the room and not really uh, to the kitchen. So this is how it is. Now, uh, analyzing the, the two, uh, two dwellings of the same family, uh, the old village dwelling, uh, what you see in red is all abandoned as in they, it is in a dilapidated state and nobody really stays there. All the three brothers have migrated to the farmhouse because of the good farming which is happening. Also, there is an expansion in the family which can't really happen in the old house of the village. So now in the farmhouse, uh, they have, if you see on the bottom uh, left hand side, it's stage one, stage two, stage three. These are the kind of progression which are seen in the village uh, on the, the house in the farm. The first progression was two rooms and a separate room because they are higher. So male uh, are only invited to the guest room. Rest of the place of the house is used by women and children. And the kitchen is at the far end and it is connected by a sort of a plinth. And a tree was there and the whole uh, courtyard was sort of still not defined uh, as a defined didn't have a defined use the second progression was an existence of the toilet the moment toilet blocks were built here uh, the whole uh, use or the movement pattern of the courtyard changed and uh, much of the activity started to happen all around the kitchen and the and the toilet block and they planted some more tree to sort of cover that part uh, and the latest uh, progression was uh, on the right hand side and uh, that particular uh, uh, structure is used for the farm produce and not really is habitable. So this is what happened. In the second case study, what you see is the village, which is the dominant community is Patel community. The village is called Muruka. Uh, it is on the fringe of the Gir forest. You see a different uh, sort of uh, things happening here. Uh, there is a higher house, which is an old house, and uh, three brothers of the same family have migrated to Surat uh, for the diamond business. And one family stays here, keeping taking care of the farms uh, and the produce of the farms. Uh, what you see here is the old house and the family which stays here. Uh, and what you see here is the the parts of the osri, the semi-open parts which are uh, which are which belong to other brothers, but they are now used as some sort of a storage and not really active. Um, and the second case study I have taken of the same village is uh, belonging to a Patel family. Here, the whole. Uh, the, the typology of Osri, which is outside connecting to the open space has been shifted to in the middle. And as you can see in the picture here, the, the central portion, which is a Osri is now a vertical uh, space, which is connected by the rooms and uh, a very different structure has been built here, aspiring 
a town like house uh, in a village uh, normally what you find uh, it's very uh, different again this decision was built uh, was taken by the family who's who's wanting to stay in the village they are also farmers and built also by the locals so this is how the osri has been reinterpreted here uh, as a central portion uh, the third case study i have taken is khardwadi which is next to the uh, very uh, uh, important town called sardar next to rajkot uh, city and it is the its proximity to the to the uh, larger city has uh, sort of uh, changed uh, a kind of a, in a kind of an attitude towards the village one one seeks over years so uh, i'm taking a case study of a, a koli family here which is uh, which the front room has been now changed into a small industry which is a diamond uh, diamond polishing uh, machines they have put up and they have people coming from rajkot to work here for a day and they go back the old house and the presence of the pee remains there uh, and the osri of the old house is used by one brother who is uh, managing the industry uh, this is how it works the uh, the study done in 2005 uh, from my student thesis student i was guiding her thesis it reveals that the presence of the pier and the front room actually opened up the courtyard very well uh, what you see in the center is a small diagram a uh, plan now what has happened is because of the industry and the manner in which the steps are done the courtyard has gained much more privacy and has remained much private uh, and it is deliberately done so that it it sort of doesn't include uh, infringe into the privacy of the people another room is one room is locked and one room is used as a store and uh, the the family has shifted to the farm and not really living here permanently uh, so this is the third and the fourth uh, is uh, panchtalavda uh, village near bhavnagar what you see here is a mix of pre cast uh, uh, concrete and concrete uh, structures with uh, adobe uh, and uh, mangalore tile roof roof majority of this village is darbar uh, and ayer communities and predominantly farmers i have studied uh, a house which is uh, which is belonging to a family of grandparents a widow mother and a son and this is how their dela uh, sort of house works you enter and there is a old part and there is a new part and uh, the new part uh, this is how it works what you see in the slide here the the new portion is actually not habitable they have they have been using it uh, for the for to keep the produce of the farm and only the old part is been used actively even as a living spaces the old part is used uh, it is interesting to observe that in a new part uh, new part there is uh, there is a kitchen which is a standing kitchen being done and there is a mud stove room uh, to cook uh, millet rotis so these are the new sort of additions you see in this region in many houses they have two small uh, spaces uh, been created please, but there is after sorry, another one yes. minute or two minutes okay yes 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 so uh, basically uh, the the old kitchen and the space in front of the old kitchen is used as to consume food and water space wherein the new spaces are not really used at all uh, so coming to the conclusion that how what sort of factors of affect this sort of changes so government schemes uh, uh, like swachh bharat on and sardar patel awas yojana has has sort of put this uh, things of uh, aiding uh, aiding structures um, and which are not really uh, sensitive towards uh, formation of the courtyard or the location in which where should they be built and how they should be built a uh, change due to industrial development a lot of influence is there because of the uh, the industries around uh, proximity to the town uh, migration to larger uh, cities uh migration from farms to the will uh, migration from villages to the farms changing rail phone rainfall pattern uh change in occupation reinterpretation of spaces uh what really remains constant is the values and the kind of uh, association with people uh built uh people have with the spaces they use so the places of cooking places of uh, drinking water uh 
uh, and places to consume food and the manner in which they associate ordo room and the osri has not really changed much and it has remained uh, rooted to how people uh, aspire how people want them to be so these are the some references and uh, this is i i thank you uh, isvs i thank uh, ipsa to give me opportunity to uh, do uh, village studies so that i can be continuously engaged i am thankful to my office and uh, intac to give me scholarship to do this research for a year and a half uh, to study the entire region thank you Ranjit, please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, thank you, Vinda, uh, for that uh, very interesting presentation. Um, you showed us how the um, houses and the dwellings are undergoing huge transformations in one sense, but at the same time, uh, retaining the values, as you said, some of the places and the values associated with those places seems to be intact, which seems to strike a chord with uh, the previous presentation um, in which uh, I think uh, Richa was talking about um, where the, the, the culture has not changed. So um, we've had uh, four presentations in this uh, session and there is an underlying theme that seems to be um, present in all of these presentations, except in the first one, which in India, I uh, was talking about the redomestication, and I was uh, really struck by the fact that he was um, demonstrating that domestication and redomestication that we were trying to focus in this seminar are indeed things that have been happening throughout the history, uh, as she showed in her case study, and is nothing new. Perhaps uh, the uh, redomestication that we wanted to focus post uh, COVID is uh, just another phase of that uh, process, as she says. The other presentations uh, took us to the um, basic idea of change that is inevitable in all things, including vernacular. And uh, the fact that there are certain things change, particularly the materials and the forms and construction technologies and so on and so forth. But the um, values, it seems, uh, are not necessarily changing as much as uh, visibly as they seem to be. But there are fundamental issues uh, in, that, in that observation and in those presentations. So I think the, um, the time is now a little bit limited, but nevertheless, we will spend about five, six minutes or 10 minutes to uh, discuss those four papers. And I would uh, invite um, my session assistants, Usma Khan, if there are any questions to raise from there, from the recordings, and if not, or even if it, it does, I would like the audience to actually raise the questions. So Usma, if you have any questions there, could you? Um, yes, sir. Uh, Pratish sir wants to ask a question. So please. Yes, Pratish, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you all the uh, panelists for wonderful presentation very, very enlightening session. Uh, and my, my question is more, more of a comment and a matter of discussion with Brinda. And Brinda, I've been really observing your work for, for almost more than a decade. And it's very nice to see that you stuck on to one geographical region and continue to study it year after year. And I think it seems that you have formed a good critical mass in your work. And uh, going ahead with this observation that Ranjit made, about your, your conclusions that it seems the value systems uh, remain the same, whereas space per se might change a bit, but there's something that's very constant. Uh, what would you speculate as the next step in terms of one, uh, theoretical formulation, because uh, one, if I were to you know, stick my neck out and say, well, what Brinda is really trying to say here is that our notion of looking at architecture from a formal visual or a typological perspective, and that's how all of us have been trained, you and I have been trained with that tradition, is, 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 doesn't hold good when we look at, uh, look at such, uh, such data sets. 
whereas one need to start looking at architecture from the questions of maybe associations and not from visuality so would you like to and i think you are in a good position to kind of you know uh, propose something far more uh, fundamental because it's all there it seems what would you say about that yes uh, in fact uh, you can't really generalize uh, the typology uh, when i'm talking about this particular region and uh, because you cannot generalize the typology typology means uh, the formation of the entire compound to the location of different sets of activity and the and the functions related to those activities and the main spaces and the functions so i'm i'm sort of envisaging that the whole definition of the main spaces uh, are sort of re re are into a some sort of a transformation because if you see uh, uh, old houses and the dowry of the women which has been arranged in the old houses and the height of those vessels been put up or the manner in which the depth of the shelf or the amount of vessels which are going to be arranged in a room is far more different than the new spaces just because the way the material is used the heights have changed the amount of wall surfaces have changed because the spanning has changed so i'm i'm not equipped as an anthropologist to study this in detail but i see a definite observation of a uh, re uh, no there are there is a transformation in the main space as a room room is the most important space in the village house and the second most important space is the the compound the open space itself and i see because of uh, because of different uh, technological ad advancements and the the changing pattern of occupation has really sort of uh, you know the the open space is, is struggling because uh, the open space which is which is made for 40 people or 20 people to live in one compound has remained uh, only for two people now so how does that get redefined i think that has a major in shift into the village dwelling which are going to be newly built or reconstructed or remodified that is what i feel thank you um, yeah thank you uh, but i i have a, i have a question here really speaking um um brenda was saying that typology cannot be generalized um uh, to some extent it is true and i think you could probably see commonality of the typology existing in a particular region but while i was watching the presentation i noticed that you were talking about courtyard houses and the courtyard as a typology actually exists not only in india not only in this village but right across the world so at one level at a primordial level the typology can actually be generalized and i was also seeing through the plans of those uh, courtyard houses um which were very similar to um, some of the courtyard houses in sri lanka and i said it is very similar and it seems that you know if the community is engaged in agriculture and they built traditional um, courtyard houses it seems that uh, as a human nature they tend to construct very similar typologies but i think the issue is not the typology itself uh, this raises the question of domesticity that we were trying to focus on i think it is the domesticity which is the um outcome of that occupation or habitation of that space which is what prinda was saying eventually in terms of the the manner in which the women were adorning the uh, bed space and the uh, surrounding of the bed and so on which is certainly unique in that place obviously i i wouldn't imagine the same thing to be happening in another place in another courtyard house despite the fact that the courtyards would be very similar or the arrangement of the rooms would be very similar so i think uh, uh, pratish was right in the sense saying that we are trained to be looking at the physical the visual and not being able to grasp the uh, nuances of habitation and domesticity that exist uh, as a result of this the the relationship that comes into being between the person and the space uh, which is what i think we need to be focusing on uh, rather than the, the, the appearance of the Uh, configuration of the building or the appearance of the home itself. 
uh, I would think that you would, despite the fact that you were saying, well, I'm not an anthropologist and therefore I wouldn't be, but I think you do have these skills to make the observations. As much as you make the observations of the building, you, could, you have already made the observation of the uh, women and how they occupy and displace space. So we should be able to explore that. I would like. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, there's a question by Professor Gunawan uh, that COVID-19 has prompted many societies to ask even about religion. How does how that affects the space? This is for, in general, for all the speakers of the session. Could, could you repeat that question? Yes. Okay, let, let, let me phrase it. Yeah, okay. We know the pandemic actually challenged us even ask us to ask our religion, the place of worship, which prohibit a lot of crowding, right? So it must affect the space, but your research hasn't gone up to that. Uh, so what is your opinion? Just a clue. For um, all the speakers, you analyze about the space, right? And you make constancy and change. Mm -hmm. There must be a space of worship. And um, how it change? Can you make kind of expectation? Okay, so uh, I had a very uh, interesting, yeah. because uh, of the lockdown, uh, I couldn't really go to the villages, but I was really uh, concerned that how the abandoned spaces or the spaces which are not used at that time of the dwelling, how they are used now because there was a lot of migration from city to the village back because villages didn't really quite suffer from COVID that much as much as the cities. So I had a telephonic conversation with many of the people's houses I measured through. And uh, there is definitely a crowding in the, in the dwelling. And uh, uh, the most uh, challenging part was the kitchen and how do you really keep the sacredness of the kitchen and who would cook where and how from the same family, because suddenly the social hierarchy started to play in role, who's cooking when, who's, uh, who's not in a, in a position to worship in the same house or position to uh, cook in certain times of women menstruation cycle. So there are so many conditioning started to happen. It, it wasn't really pleasant to hear of contradictions from the village, from the same families uh, who stayed in the village and stayed in the city. So there was a lot of conflict and a lot of um, haphazardness, uh, but this is how the things change when it comes to cooking and when it came to occupying the space. Thank you. Yeah, but how the values of religion was kept? Um, the most important and the sacred part is the kitchen and the place of water. Mm. So uh, when a woman is going through a, a menstrual cycle, she's not supposed to cook or touch the water or fetch the water from the well. So uh, there was a dynamism connected there because uh, the women in the city did not quite believe in all this, where the village women would. So there, there was a shift and the new temporary kitchen spaces were made for the same family. Um, that's all, this is all from the conversations. So I have not really visited myself these places, but this is from the telephonic conversations. You hear that these are the kind of shifts which are happening due to pandemic. Uh, other speakers, please. Yes, I yes. just want uh, to get information. I'm sure India wants to say something. No right or wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Gunawan. Okay, um, just like Brinda, uh, I also tried to make a call several times to the people in the Karampuang that day, and I was asking about how the uh, how does uh, how did the COVID uh, affect the people, and simply they said that is an urban urban disease. It it did not come to us. That's what they said, and then. But anyway, I try to explore and then, okay, then I learned that uh, in Sinjai district, it is in the Kabupaten, in Sinjai district, the COVID reached there, but it did not reach out the, uh, the, the area, the Karampuang, this, uh, the village. But I have a, sus a suspicion, which is, which, of course, this needs another research because 
um, the Karampuang, as I, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, they have these other EPA values, these other EPA leaders. And then uh, somehow this, this, this leadership is quite uh, peculiar because actually, uh, of course, Amatoa is the highest because he is the, uh, believed to be the kin, the kin of the, uh, of the descendant of the Tomanurung, that uh, female ancestors. But practically, any, any of these leaders can take lead in any uh, particular conditions. Like when Islam came, the guru come, come up and then they try to consolidate things. And then when this uh, modernization came and everything's always, uh, problems appears, uh, 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 problems always about land, how, how the land use uh, took place, how the, the government took over the, uh, some of the forest, uh, uh, part of the forest so that they could not access the rotan, for instance, the rotan. So that is the, uh, that is the gela. Uh, I suspect Sanro this, uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in, this COVID, in this COVID era must have, uh, must have a important role because Sanro is uh, responsible for the social well-being and he is also, she is also, um, she is also very uh, responsible in uh, making medications and then, and then uh, treating the, the sick. This is, this is the, the role of Sanro. So it is not some, um, uh, it doesn't mean that Sandro make a medicine something, but she must take lead in this, uh, in this sense. Take leads and then uh, accompanied by the other leaders to make the uh, a necessary, a necessary steps. But what is, uh, how, how did it happen? That's what I need to, to, uh, to do for uh, to do for that. But what important is that these people are always ready to, uh, to, I'm not saying changing, uh, they are always ready to consolidate, to consolidate themselves according to the, the ongoing uh, uh, occurrence that, uh, that take place. And this is the kind of flexibility which I learned uh, very, very, uh, uh, very fluid in, in Karampuang. Maybe uh, so far that's- Thank you, I thank you. Say. I want to hear more from other speakers. Yeah. Um, if I may say, yeah, some, someone wants to speak. Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, please. Richard, yes, you go ahead. I'll speak after. Sir, it's like about in Chhattisgarh, they are, you know, they are very, they have this tribal kind of lifestyle, so they don't really have one particular deity that they pay, pray to or something like that. They have their plants and the nature which they go to. So there is something called a Kul Devi that's uh, the deity for the entire village. So that could be anything. In this case, in Kudargarh, we have a tree that they pray to be which is uh, at the outskirts of the village. So in this time of COVID, which is, I was uh, fortunate to visit them post-COVID situation uh, in recent oh. time. So what they did is, they always, all of them have sacred plants, which are there in the courtyard. It's, there, it's common in every house that is there. So they have been praying to that and uh, they have started taking, you know, these stones which they got from around their house and they enter deity by themselves, you know, praying to them as if they were praying to the natural beings there. So uh, there was not much of um, you know, uh, turbulence which came around due to religion in their, uh, you know, in their uh, sectors. What they really felt was there were few people who were getting around nearby towns to work. And they were the ones who faced a bit of issue. Otherwise, for that area, it is still very, um, I mean, I would say they were very... Um, comfortable with such kind of situation because they have been in their practices how, how they have been they've already been practicing the kind of rules and regulations that were coming up to avoid COVID so they you know because we see the kind of planning they have they have the outer courtyard uh, or the outer veranda which is called the Utla where they sit and do so interactions so they're not very close to each other they usually sit in front of their own houses and interact so those uh, practices were already in place so for them it was uh, not so much as a hindrance as I think we felt in urban areas. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to add something here, Professor Gunavana. It's a very interesting question because um, religion, uh, from, from what I understand, is uh, the, the kind of um, set of thoughts that people have cultivated in order to find solace in the situations of um, um, in situations of, um, what shall I say, uh, situations beyond their control and they believe that there is some, some other force 
that is there to take care of your being, which you are unable to do yourself as, as ordinary mortals. Now, pandemic is indeed one of those situations in which we don't know. We don't know what's going on and we are completely helpless. And most communities feel that they should have solace from religious uh, entities, situations and so on. I can give you an example of what's happening in Sri Lanka. In fact, there are two things that are uh, happening right now. One of which is that um, people have resorted to um, belief systems and religions uh, practices to the extent that uh, traditional uh, physicians, the doctors so-called, have invented traditional medicines supposedly being able to cure or prevent the COVID happening. Uh, there's a huge uh, ha ho about it because they, there are some people who have invented those uh, traditional medicines using our weather. And the government has been promoting them uh, and, and the people have claimed that they actually got the prescription for the medicine from some unknown sources. And then the medical community has uh, risen against that, that idea because this is mysticism and promoting uh, you know, tribal mentality and so on and so forth. It's been a huge issue because uh, the, the, the Ministry of Health who is supposed to be promoting the Western medical systems as a, result, as a response to the COVID-19 and the spread of virus, which is far better understood by the Western medicine. The Ministry of Health has been going around the country uh, dropping blessed water into rivers in the, in, with the intention that it will help uh, the spread of the disease. And, uh, you know, there, are, there is a huge uh, confrontation between traditions, the mythical beliefs and the practices which have come to the forefront because people are now looking for solace uh, guidance from sources beyond their comprehension because they are in such a vulnerable situation. I would think that they don't have immediate uh, implications in the domestic space or the buildings or the homes and arrangements. But as a society, conceptually and um, imaginatively, they are moving forward to um, both challenge those notions and as, at the same time pursue those uh, notions vigorously uh, by part of the community. It's a very may interesting add, question. Sir? May I add something? Yes, please. Yes. Yes, uh, uh, I want to add more in, uh, uh, yes, indeed, it, it, uh, spatially or physically, it may not uh, directly uh, associate with, the, with this COVID, but I believe uh, uh, what I learned from Sandro, for instance, it is uh, the, nurturing, uh, the, the, the nurturing characters or the nurturing senses must, be, uh, must come up uh, more now. Like uh, I learned, in, I, actually I learned from Kerala. They have this uh, goddess of chicken pox, and they have this, uh, they have this shrine. They have this that, that shrine, which which uh, uh, people come for puja to uh, to avoid for uh, sickness and other things. And but what I what 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 make me interest uh, what interests me from this uh, Mariama temple in in Kerala and also in Sandro is that this female this female character is uh, is uh, is very uh, important so then i figure out what is this behind these female characters then i, I don't know but m maybe this kind of uh, our our conceptions of uh, designing or even planning is per perhaps is too patriarchy it's too uh, patriarchal so we you may need something which is uh, more nurturing which is more uh, uh, which endorse more communal uh, solidarity and then against this individual life. So like when these people are uh, saying that, uh, okay, that is an urban disease, that's, that's a COVID thing. So I assume that this might have something to do with what is the city, uh, how the city characterize, uh, how they understand the city and what is the rural uh, things. Of course, I don't like this divide, but we can learn from these characters about this. In, what is being individual? What is solidarity? And how this can be? Actually, we need this to, uh, to uh, yeah, to to, uh, to incorporate the solidarity into the the urban context, for instance. That's how I did. I want to add. 
Thank you, Inda. Are there any others who want to contribute to the question? Or are um, there any other question? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, there's a question by Jitendra to Brinda and Richa that if uh, she could, they could shed any light upon what village people and the inhabitants think about their living environments. Do they question as much as we do? Um, uh, yes, uh, not directly questions, but there are very, uh, there are very uh, minute observations. And uh, the reason they choose to live in the old structures and not really new liberty itself says that uh, they, they are somehow selecting one over the other. So uh, there, are, there are observations, there are discussions with them that why would you not stay in a new building and why would you really want to occupy the old? And uh, they are very, very uh, clear about uh, the, the manner in which they associate with, with their older dwelling, starting from building processes to arrangement of the dowry, to cooking places, to the scale of the cooking place, to the space where they eat uh, together. It is all so very valid. And they keep on repeating these values over and over again. Uh, though the new structures are also built by them, but somehow the, the material aspect doesn't really allow them to use the new spaces in the same manner. So the conscious decision itself says that they are questioning, but it just seems that they are not putting it across the manner in which we do. I'm sure within them, they are discussing what is really better for them and which is not. Thank you. Richa, over to you. So actually, if you see in Chhattisgarh, they are, uh, they are dependent more on the houses as per their workability, so their spaces should not be disturbed, seeing it whichever material technology that is coming up. But uh, the other thing that is widely seen is looking at the nearby towns, looking at the people who have converted their house, transformed their houses rather. There are uh, most of the people in the village who have now started thinking that their house also should look like this. So uh, converting into a pakka house is something which they wish that, uh, you know, if they have that, they would not have to time and again uh, you know, renovate their house or time and again rebuild the mud wall that comes down. So these are the perspectives I think that they have started to come up with. They don't look at that I should have something which is a very good kind of construction technology that is there. But it's just uh, the visual impact that they see from the other houses which they are trying to adapt. Other than that, uh, I don't think they look at it in that manner. They're very happy with the kind of spaces that have that are there in their houses. And uh, they mostly look at that in their day-to-day -day lifestyle. Thank you. Um, I think we are sort of going beyond the time. Um, am yes, I right? Sir. So as there are no more questions, this brings us to the end of the last session of our conference. And... Uh, Okay, it's been a delight to see such interesting presentations and enthusiasm by all the speakers and panelists. Uh, I request Professor Ranji to conclude the session and thereafter we'll be rejoining after a five minutes break. Okay, thank you very much uh, for all the presenters, uh, for the wonderful presentations in terms of drawing our attention to the constancy and the change, the transformations that are taking place in the vernacular settlements, which is a recurring theme without any question. And of course, uh, the, although it is not directly connected to the domesticity and the, uh, and the COVID-19 issue, I think there is an implied uh, relationship that is being constructed through them. So thank you very much for all those presentations and thank you very much for the questions and particularly the question about the faith and religion and what roles uh, they seem to be playing in these uh, transformations. Uh, all right, so we will take a five minutes break and come back uh, through the next session. Uh, Professor Sanjeev, uh, uh, do, yeah. we, do we? Uh, we will take a break of five minutes. Thank you, Ranjit. And uh, uh, Nikki has already joined in and uh, uh, President Council of Architecture will join in in five minutes time. So, so we will meet, we will invite Professor Habib first or Mickey first? Yeah, Professor Habib will be joining in five minutes. So we will have his speech first or the keynote first? Which one first? Uh, uh, what you'll have to do, 
uh, you'll have to uh, uh, start the keynote session and then uh, you will invite Habib, uh, President Council of Architecture, uh, to speak a few uh, words for uh, the closing uh, uh, session. And then, yeah. in the, and then you will introduce Mickey uh, to all the uh, panelists and attendees. And then you will invite Mickey for the keynote address. And right, after the keynote address, once we are summing up, um, yeah. at the end, uh, uh, we will be basically, uh, 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 as uh, Secretary ISVS, uh, Pratyush uh, wants to say something that he will say, and he has to make some announcements. He will do that. And sure. at the end, vote of thanks will be given by uh, Professor Rajay Vinodia from my side, our yeah. side, and then uh, we will close the session. Okay. Okay, so we need to five minutes. Yeah. So Habib will be coming just uh, in five minutes. So we take a five minutes break and then uh, we get back to the our last session. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. सबको हेलो हाय हबीब क्या हाल है भाई हाय 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 संजीव यार यार तेरी दाढ़ी एकदम सफेद सफेद हो गई है तो फिर ही ठीक है यार एस नेचुरल है एस वर्ना कलर एस पॉसिबल यस यस You were traveling. ऐसा लग रहा था गाड़ी में था। हाँ, I was traveling. I just came back. I just returned. तो रंजीत ये आप मेट रंजीत? No, no, I have not. I have not met. Mickey is also here. Ranjit is here. Pratyush is here. Yes, hi, hi, hi everyone. Secretary ISPS Ranjit is. All over was uh, he is also the one of the core committee members of ISVS. Mickey is here, so. Hi, baby. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. Good, good. All well, all well. And uh, uh, so, uh, Ranjit, I sent you a message. Oh, did you? Yeah, on WhatsApp. So, all Mickey. Right, sir. Mickey. 
next isvs navrachna university can do it had a word with provost mera mera ye ye anuman tha anuman <laughs> is convinced ranjit is convinced let's bring it back to gujarat meki yeah yeah i'll be there you will have to be there <laughs> what you will be there yeah. great so all attending thanks for joining professor habib really really glad you could make it my pleasure my pleasure uh, it was when sanjeev told me i said use your good offices use your friendship many <laughs> <laughs> always anything from a necklace that's great nice to hear so we had uh, this is uh, the third day and uh, as i think i also mentioned this is now almost a 21 year old uh, kind of a series 10 yeah. uh, 10th isvs uh, so started in 1999 in indonesia by professor gunawan who is around here i think he is taking a break he started it and then uh, from then on mickey sutra seno and ranjit also joined Uh, so for the first uh, five years, it was in Indonesia. Then we had a big one at Sept in 2007, which Miki mm -hmm. was heading and I was helping him. We were together in that. Uh, then from Sept, it went to Colombo, that Ranjit uh, had uh, you know worked out with the University of Moratuwa, a very good university. Mm -hmm. uh, then it went to North Cyprus. Uh, mm -hmm. North Cyprus. It went to uh, Technical University in Istanbul. So this is the University of Orhan Pamuk, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, it went to Makassar in Indonesia, and then to Bali, and now it has come back to India. And mm -hmm. we want to keep it in India for another two years, and then it will go away. That's uh, Professor Gunawan there. Indonesia. Yes, I mean. Yeah. Uh, Professor Gunawan, uh, Habib Khan, uh, President Council of Architecture India is here, so and he will be. He agreed to come for the well, it, uh, the final session where Mickey will be doing a, giving a keynote. Um, so, uh, so we we start in another. Uh, shall we start now? Hmm? Yes, I think. It is such a point. We are already two forty-six, so we can start now. I think we are on live on YouTube. In any case, so we better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. O over to you, Ranji. All right. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to the ISVS final session, and I have the honor of uh, chairing this final session. Uh, and we are delighted to um, have been able to meet uh, Professor Habib Khan. Uh, the uh, the chair of the council of architecture of india and um, invite him to uh, make a small uh, address to the gathering before we do that let me introduce uh, professor habib khan a um, long uh, list of accomplishments and i don't intend to cut anything so let me read uh, the introduction that we have architect habib khan graduated in architecture from vnit formerly vrce and went to the usa where he completed his masters in architectural design from the university of illinois urbana campaign after his masters degree he worked in philadelphia coordinating major retail design projects in retail giants across the world he returned to india in 1990 and started his own private practice he was awarded the jiia best interior design award by the indian institute of architects in 1998 and iia kaff young architects award in the year 2000 uh, he was also awarded the orange city achievement award in 2009 and state level excellence in architecture and education award by the iia maharashtra chapter in 2011 recently he and smita were awarded the prestigious in bau award 2018 for large scale promotion of traditional and vernacular architecture in the world so he is invariably connected to the vernacular without any questions uh, he deserves a place here it bow is an organization promoted by the prince of charles foundation and their jd campus project which was which awarded the excellence award in the new building category 
architecture to uh, him architect habib khan is a passion total commitment and something to enjoy and indulge in he is fiercely committed to architecture being contextual and relevant he believes that architecture shall be responsive to traditions climate context and the environmental and ecological responsible his architecture is organic traditional contextual and contemporary His architectural practice, Smita and Habib Khan Architects, mostly deals with campus designs, institutions, and wildlife research. He has worked with major hospitality groups like Taj, Citrus, Mahua, and Celebrations, and few major campuses in Central India. Habib has been invited to many national and international conferences as keynote speaker. Some of the few are IIA NADCON in 2009, Nagpur and 2012 in Rajpur, IIID NADCON at Goa in 2008, Kolhapur 2014 and Indore in 2015. Chithale Endowment Lecture, Anna University, Chennai and the IIID Design Yatra in about 12 cities. He was also invited to speak at international conferences of IAPS, Glasgow in 2012. Degro 2012 Venice and Degro 2016 in Budapest. Architect Habib Khan is also involved in teaching since the beginning of his career. He has been taking guest lectures and engaging design studios in architectural colleges all over the country apart from juries and examinations. He is currently the director at Priyadarshini Institute of Architecture and Design Studies Nagpur and Lokmanya Tilak Institute of Architecture and Design Studies at Mumbai. His design teaching involves around sensitizing students towards their own heritage and roots, context and climate within the framework of being contemporary. Habib has actively been working with the government of Maharashtra on field policy framing guidelines. He has also been nominated by the government of Maharashtra on the Council of Architecture. He is currently the president of the Council of Architecture. Habib is an avid painter and has exhibited his paintings on Mahabharata. Ramayan and Kabir. He also dabbles in poetry and has written songs for IIID, Natcon Indo, Design Yatra, and IIA Centenary Anthem, and the theme song of Betty Bacho Betty Padu campaign. I believe I pronounced it well. Thank you very much for being with us, Professor Habib Khan. Uh, I would like you to invite you to address the gathering this afternoon and grace the occasion. Uh, please, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ranjit, uh, for a very long uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from the Council of Architecture. Uh, Pratyush, Sanjeev, Miki, and all fellow distinguished panelists, keynote speakers, delegates, fellow architects, participants, students, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a pleasure to be amongst my own fraternity, and. Uh, to share thoughts and to learn from all of you ISVS is doing phenomenal work i have been discussing with sanjeev since a long time about this conference in fact we were supposed to at this uh, but somehow it has become an online uh, conference due to the exceptional circumstances that our world is going through vernacular architecture is very close to my heart i have been practicing traditional architecture based on context climate people culture whom we built for almost since last 30 years we've been trying to teach that to younger students we've been trying to conduct studios vernacular studios and we've been trying to promote this thought process across the country and the world if possible and uh, and and i feel that all architecture has to be has to be has to be contextual has to be has to be respecting climate and culture and the people that we're building for and in this uh, uh, wave of globalization after the industrial revolution and the and the independence of our country the 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 internationalism that swept our country has seen has made our architecture almost redundant to our context and uh, it is very easy to get swayed uh, by the by the wave of so called uh, non contextual elements of architectural design and architectural forms 
and architectural belt mass that this thought process of vernacular architecture relevant architecture sensitive architecture traditional architecture gets swayed away by the by the wave of internationalism and globalization i am not against uh, i am not against uh, modernization or i am not against any other kind of isms but what i am for is that we need to we need to have a sensitive architecture which responds to our economy to our culture to our people to our traditions and 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 respects all of them and that is what uh, we all stand for uh, we need to break the chain in the thought process of our younger architects and future generations who are to come and make them aware and sensitize them to this thought process wherein we are able to produce architecture of sense architecture of uh, architecture which is very close to our country and to our people and uh, if we are able to do that through conferences like this deliberations like these uh, i think we'll be doing human service to to architecture and architectural development future architectural development of our country and uh, uh, it's not a easy job it it needs a lot of uh, efforts a lot of commitment and a lot of passion to do that and i am sure all the delegates present here uh, keynote speakers speakers present here are all thinking in the same direction we are all, all on the same page and i am sure we'll be able to make some difference uh, to the entire uh, milieu of uh, architectural education in our country which will ultimately result in sensitive architectural practices in the future we at the council also want to promote humane in architecture and we can do we will do whatever we can uh, to help promote this cause and i would request the organizers of this conference to document the proceedings and if possible uh, share it with the council so that we can take it across to all the institutes across the country 465 plus and uh, also share with the architects who are practicing which are more than about 1 lakh 25000 or so we can also publish through the council portals publication houses where where we were able to help a little in the cause of vernacular architecture and it gives me immense pleasure to be here amongst all of you today and to hear miki this ig after this and uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me here and do let us know what we can do at the council to promote this cause and to work for this cause thank you sanjeev for giving me this opportunity to to speak few words in this august gathering it's always a pleasure thank you so much thank you very much architect habib khan for that uh, brief but very inspiring speech and i think india is blessed to have you as the um, president of the architecture council is such yes. understanding to be able to promote architecture to be sensitive as you rightly said um i hope uh, that uh, the indian vernacular architecture and uh, settlements will get the support and the um contribution that it deserves from the architects in india through your guidance and will uh, manage to maintain its identity culture and other practices that are necessary and useful as holistic and wholesome practices in the real world thank you very much again thank you you grace the location and it's a great honor to have you with us thank you thank you thanks a lot um now i have the great honor of introducing